Hi, I'm Chris Fitzgerald and welcome to the second installment of the Bacrilich series. If you're new to the series, you may want to go back and check out the first episode which deals with some basic techniques that will be used throughout the series and also explains in great detail why the series was created. But in short, the series was created as a technical resource for bassists who play prim primarily pizzicato, who play with their fingers to have some technical etudes based on some of the world's greatest music, namely the cello suites of J.S. Bach. And these suites, because they were originally written for the cello, which has a much shorter string length than the bass, and because in this series we, we choose to arrange the suites as low on the bass as possible, where most pizzicato basses play, presents us with a lot of challenges that require us to really focus on specific aspects of technique in order to make the music speak. Having said that, we'll move on to the etude in question, the prelude from the first cello suite. Well, the prelude to the first cello suite is easily the most famous and iconic of all the cello suite movements. It's been used in many, many audio recordings and even films, and as soon as it starts to play, pretty much everyone, whether they're a musician or not, tends to know this music or at least have heard it. For the purposes of an etude, it presents us with a number of challenges. Uh, like all the preludes of the cello suites, it is through composed, so there's no material that needs to be repeated, there's no repeat structure in the form of the piece. Um, but for this specific piece, it's almost entirely legato from beginning to end. And so we'll start there with looking at the techniques that we're going to need in order to be able to play it and, and play it musically. Uh, we need to review our legato techniques that we'll be using throughout the arrangement of this piece. So if you remember from the first episode, we have a number of different types of legato that we can use. First is called uh, articulated legato, where we actually pluck each note, but try to connect them as best we can. So in articulated legato, you're trying to minimize the gap between notes caused by the plucking fingers restriking the string to the point where the illusion is that the notes actually run together as though they were under a slur. We also have several left hand techniques uh, and a, a specific right hand technique that will enable us to create a legato articulation throughout this particular etude. Um, the first, um, these are all covered in the first episode, by the way, but I'm going to review them briefly here. The first is the hammer-on in which a note is played, and then the upper note is hammered on by the left hand. The second is pull-off, which figures very greatly in this etude because it's almost as though the music were written around the idea of this descending stepwise motion being repeated throughout. So, and in the pull-off, as we said in the first episode, we're actually pulling sideways with the upper finger to give a legato articulation to the lower note. And last, there is the rake. And the rake is actually a right-hand technique, but it's a combination of right and left-hand techniques. So with the rake, pulling from one string and then crossing onto another string, which means that the second string doesn't have to be stopped. So the sound never stops. With a rake, you play the first note and then attack the second note and then let go of the first note. You want to be careful, unless you do it on purpose, you want to be careful not to let no both notes sound for an extended period of time unless that's your intent. So we don't usually want this. Which ends up being a double stop. Occasionally we do, but for most of this etude we don't. Uh, we want a smooth connection from the first note to the second note and then release with the left hand the first note. So this piece generally is structured in three sections. The first one includes um, 
the figure which everyone knows the piece by, this figure of a low note sweeping up to a high note and moving back down to the low note. The second section is almost a completely differently composed section, uh, which just connects the first section and the third section. And there's a pause between the first section and the second section. The third section is the completion of the movement. Um, It's almost like an answer to the question posed by the second section. So as we go through this etude in this particular installment of the video, I'd like to look at a few passages from each section and go over a few bars of each in detail so that anyone actually working through the etude can uh, have some examples of how some of the technical hurdles in each section might be handled. And we'll start with the first four bars of the piece and go on from there. The first four measures of the movement provide us with a microcosm of so many techniques that are needed to play a large percentage of the movement. So I'd like to focus on those now. Uh, they include both the hammer-on, the rake, and the articulated legato. They involve some things which set the tone for how we move our body in order to play this piece. And so let's take a look, a closer look at those four measures. Um, in measure one, we have the pull-off and the rake and the articulated legato, um, and also the ways that the body needs to move. So starting with the, the left hand, we have the pull-off we're bolstered by the open string that we have so we can center our intonation there. Um, the pull-off is only a small part of it though because the right arm in order to achieve this sense of legato has to move fluidly. And this is one of the things where this movement was really instructive to me about the choreography of playing the bass. And it's almost like your, your, your body, especially your upper body is doing a dance in order to make the music come out correctly. So in this first part for the right hand, if you watch the right elbow, it has to sweep up to the top string and then basically dance like this, sort of float. And as you play this passage, you really feel that this is where the control for the right arm is. It's not so much down here in the hand or even in the wrist or elbow although you can see it best at the elbow, it's here at the shoulder where this arm has to float in order to allow the hand to be in position to play. So I'll play the first four measures and then it brings up a number of difficulties that we can talk about. But here's the first four measures. So even just in those first four measures, um, it presents three really, really big problems or hurdles that we can overcome. So the first is the choreography of the right arm. In the second measure, we have the same movement up from the fourth string up to the first. We have a pull off, but then we have this rake over the interval of a minor six. While the right hand and the right arm still has the same motion that it had in the first measure, now the left hand has this issue of having to reach an interval. We can reach within one hand uh, if our hands are large enough. We can reach an in tune perfect fifth, but the minor six. Uh, for most people is too big to reach. We don't try and stretch for it. If you look at this, I can actually do it, but
but it's a really unhealthy thing to do for the hand and, and there's a lot of pain in the forearm when I do this. So instead of trying to reach for it and stretch the hand out in this really awkward way, um, the thing to do here and the purpose of this measure in the etude is to move the fingers using, like with the right arm when we raked from the G to the D. It's this floating elbow and shoulder assembly here. With the left hand, going from the C to the E. It actually happens here in the shoulder as well. So you can see it best in the elbow, but trust me, it's coming here from the shoulder. So when we move from the C to the E, raking with the right hand, it's not a matter of trying to keep the hand really, really spread. It's a matter of moving from one note to the next. Using this motion of the shoulder. And look how far the shoulder actually moves in doing this. If you watch the initial clip at the very beginning of the video and you watch the two arms moving, you probably don't see as much motion as we're going to be talking about here. But here, when we're in the sort of micro zoom in view of the physical motions needed to play, we're going to exaggerate them a little bit so that we can really feel what this choreography is like. So in the second measure, in order to keep the left hand relatively relaxed, in order to get the fingers where they need to be, it is this motion. And this is something I advise students to practice very, very slowly. Rather than this, which just fills your body with tension trying to reach that ridiculous stretch. Keep the hand relaxed and draw all that intonation aim from the core rather than from the small musculature here. Okay, so now we have the first two measures, already some issues to deal with there. third measure uh, has a really awkward fingering because we end up here on this E. In the third measure we start on the G. The next two notes are F sharp on the second string and C on the first string. There's two choices. We could play the, both the F sharp and the C with the fourth finger. Or we could jump up with the second finger which is already playing the G. Either one presents its own problems and we have to try to maintain that illusion of legato as we work on this fingering paradigm. In the actual um, etude edition of the score, which um, will be published on my website along with every episode in this series, um, I'm going to put both fingerings, so either 2-2-4 two, two, four, or 2-4-4. Two, four, four. Whichever one of those you choose, and I think I played 2 2 4. in the intro, but I've played it both ways. Whichever one of those that you choose, it's really good to, to practice it in slow motion and to practice what happens again in this shoulder assembly as you as you make that shift. the 2-2 two, two. and here's the 2-4-4 four, four. and make sure that that motion gets choreographed. If I play the 2-2 two, two or the 2-4-4 two, four, four, what happens is it feels like the elbow is coming in in order to move the elbow and the shoulder both are coming in in order to move the finger where it needs to be. So it's out and then in if it's two four four same thing so it really happens back here and not up here in the hand um, okay so now we have that measure 
Notice when that figure gets repeated the second time, we can just reach down and play the G with one and keep this one, two, four. And then in the last measure, it looks like it would be really easy. If you look at it on paper, you would say, oh, this is great. I'll just play. And use the open G to play the recurring uh, G in that measure. Problem is, if you do that, you've kind of um, destroyed the articulation scheme, which is absolute legato between the high note and the low note rocking back and forth. So if we had gone, if, if up to this point we have gone which is very much legato between da do da do um, then we can't very well articulate everything again in the fourth measure. If we try to pull off that major third, it will tend to zing a little bit. It would sound like. So when I first started playing this movement and thinking, how am I going to arrange this so that the articulations sound consistent? Um, I really had to think about what, what is possible there? What is possible to do? And I think the best thing is to continue to play that drop and return as a rake which means fingering that G on the second string, through which leaves us with, sorry. And then of course it goes to the F sharp at the end of that measure. So in these first four measures, we've got a lot of things to practice very, very slowly, but which if we, if we do practice them slowly, if we take the time to choreograph the body movements that are needed to play those four measures musically and well, it will carry us a long way into the movement um, and also carry into our regular playing, whether it's jazz or just acoustic music, this idea of combining these different legato techniques into a legato concept of music. So I'll play the first four measures again, and then we're going to fast forward after this to a really difficult passage at the end of this section of the movement. My experience has been that if you can get comfortable playing those first four measures, the next 16 or so measures are going to pretty much flow because they involve the same techniques and the same sort of body choreography. For the next segment, we'll move forward to a very difficult passage at measure 20, where we have to get out of the bottom range of the bass and actually sweep up towards the top range of the bass towards this high D harmonic. The passage from measures 19 to 23 of this movement is one of the most difficult passages in the entire movement um, because it, ne it necessitates a shift from the very bottom of the bass up to the top end of our range as pizzicato players. In the original uh, cello suite movement, Bach just continued the line going down and it went down from the low E through the D to a C sharp. Um, and of course on the cello, which is tuned to a low C, the line could just continue going lower and lower. But on the bass, because uh, most pizzicato players don't have a C extension, myself included, I decided to move this passage from the C sharp uh, onward up so that the climactic portion of the music could be moving into a climactic range and enable us to play it in a musically satisfying way. The passage in question is the one that sounds like this, and I'm sure that when I play it, I will be illustrating its difficulty in no uncertain terms, because it is a very difficult passage. sloppy, but you get the idea. It is a very difficult passage. 
One of the foremost difficulties of this passage of going from the bottom of the base to the top of the base is the idea of having to find this first note, this C sharp, uh, seemingly out of thin air. I call this in my teaching studio, I call this type of note a cold note, meaning you have to reach it cold with no preparation. So as we go down from this E to try and find this C sharp, um, it seems as though we just have to reach up here and, and pray that we play that note in tune. But in fact, uh, the thing to do is to use a physical landmark to find that C sharp. In my case, I find that C sharp, it's on the fourth finger on the fourth string, I find that C sharp with the physical landmark of the way that my thumb wraps around the heel of the bass. And the best way I know of to practice this is just to, to play those five notes over and over. Play the open D, wrap the thumb around the heel in a way that you can actually feel. Um, and then that C sharp will be there. Moving on in this passage, it moves up to an open G, or moves up not to an open G, it moves up to a high G. And if we had chosen to finger that G in this arrangement, it would be very difficult to get back to that C sharp and still maintain some semblance of legato. So instead, that G is written as a harmonic. enables us to connect those notes uh, with a little overhang of the harmonic G creating a legato effect getting back to the C that follows. To find the C it's very much like finding the C sharp. Uh, to find the C sharp my thumb wrapped around the heel. You can't really see it there but it's wrapping around the heel and it gives me this feeling of where that C sharp is. To find the C natural Same basic feeling, except now my thumb is not wrapped around the heel, it's just touching the heel. And the way to practice it, take your hand off the bass and get that tactile feel of where the thumb goes to find that, you know, quote unquote, cold note. And from there, the rest of the passage can kind of be played more or less in position, in a comfortable position that we're used to. The passage immediately following that is very, very difficult because it involves a shift into thumb position from down on the neck. and. I struggle with this one for a long time when trying to work up this piece because it's it's just that one place where everything has to go just right. You know that the D is going to be played as a harmonic and because the D is a harmonic everything before it needs to be pretty in tune or the whole passage has a chance to sound really out of tune if what we play in the fingered sense doesn't match the harmonic that ends the passage. And the best way I know of to make that transition is to go back to what I'm sure every bassist who's ever had a bass lesson has studied the idea of uh, what is either called, depending on your teacher, either called the vomit technique or the drunken sailor technique. And that's where you connect notes that are far apart by basically sliding, glissando, from one to the other and stopping when you get to the note that you actually intended to stop on. The ultimate intent of this, of course, is that when we put this into performance practice, that that effect is so subtle that uh, hopefully only we can hear it, or if anyone else can hear it, it's, a, it's so quiet and so in the background that they just their brain sort of disregards it and said, okay, they just shifted from there to there and, and now they're in that new passage. Now they're in that new place on the bass. So as we practice this passage, jumping into thumb position, it 
it's going to be about using the drunken sailor. connect the stuff that's in position to that final harmonic D and hopefully still be in tune. It takes a lot of really really slow practice and again like in the very first section of this video it takes a lot of physical choreography to play these three or four bars uh, confidently because it says much about the physical feeling of playing them at this point as anything else if you can if we can train our bodies to find these connections the C sharp by use of the physical landmark and then the C natural same way and then finding the jump up to the A in thumb position by using the drunken sailor What we're really doing is connecting position to position and we all know as bassists that when you're in a position it's much easier to play in tune and it's only when you shift that intonation becomes extremely dangerous. So uh, positional landmarks for the two cold notes using the harmonic to create the illusion of legato and then using the drunken sailor to get from normal position up into thumb position to connect all of the pieces together. And that's measures 19 through 23. The passage from the pickups to measure 23 to the downbeat of measure 29 is what I'm going to be calling here the middle section of the piece. If you talk to different players and different musicologists, they'd probably all define the piece very differently uh, in terms of what the th three are two or four sections of this prelude are, but I'm calling this the middle section because it's a definite departure from the first section with the repeated figure going over and over and generating momentum. And it's also different from the last section with its ascent to the final cadence. And it's also defined by three pauses on the note D. And of course in the original Bach cello edition, uh, it went down to a low D and would pause there and then resume the motion again. In this arrangement, uh, it's going to be focused on those pauses will happen on three Ds which are written as octave harmonics, which give a nice dramatic effect. The passage basically sounds like this. There's the first D. And there's a third. Apologies for the high note with the intonation. It's a little difficult to talk and play at the same time. But in this section, I think the focus for the performer should be on the inherent lyricism of these passages, the almost rubato nature of the lines that can, that can gradually speed up and gather momentum until they pause on those D harmonics. It's a lot of fun to play. Uh, it's a lot of fun to play around with, and I think each player will uh, interpret it in a slightly different way. But all of our legato techniques are in play except I think for the rake in this passage. We have hammer-ons, lots of hammer-ons, and then pull-offs as well. So in this arrangement, while I write specific fingerings and articulations that of course anyone is welcome to follow, those are the ones that um, I used when I performed it and recorded the performance at the beginning of this video, this is a place where there's a lot of freedom in this movement to interpret as each player sees fit. And I think it's a really wonderful passage to play different ways, even a little bit each, slightly different each time you play the piece because it really is just a very lyrical, almost rhapsodic passage if you choose to play it that way. And the octave Ds, the harmonic Ds, 
give it a nice uh, framing from the fermata in measure 22 to the what we've added as a fermata on that last harmonic D at measure 29. Well, we finally reached the last section of the piece. It's one of the most climactic uh, passages ever written by Bach at the end of this movement with the rising chromatic line against the open string, finally reaching the climactic cadence in G. Um, it has a lot of uh, legato techniques that we can implement in it. There's a lot of rakes in that passage. But there are two sections in this um, particular section of the piece, two little short passages which have important uh, technical hurdles to overcome. And I'd like to touch on those really quickly before we go. And then we can get about the business of trying to put all of these pieces of this movement together. So this movement, this section of the piece starts off with a continuation of the sort of lyrical rhapsodic motion of the previous section. And then Bach leads us into this section where there's a short repeated phrase which kind of crosses over the bar line a few times and it has a uh, fingering paradigm in it, which I think is kind of important. It starts this way. And you notice in this passage, the first and second fingers have to trade back and forth with that A in order to really make it work. Once the hand gets used to that shifting of first finger to second finger for that A to facilitate the notes that revolve around it, it's not too difficult to play. The next passage in measure 34, I believe it's 34, there's a really important shift there because it's otherwise you're left with one of these drunken sailor shifts if you don't do it. And I think that's it's a little more dangerous than you need to. So when we're going this passage A, B, C on the G string, that shift to a one on the C enables, enables us to get our hand in the position sort of in the middle of the neck to make that passage work. That shift right there. And that makes everything kind of come together um, without too much intonation difficulty. And we head back down for the final ascent to the, to the climactic cadence in G. Um, and when we finally get there, everyone loves to play this passage because the the D string centers everything and gives you this big swelling of sound, uh, like filling a water balloon. Uh, but it leads to the most difficult passage in the piece. So we all know this passage. Leading up just a chromatic scale, most of it along the G string. And it's not that difficult in itself. Um, getting from there, to this thumb position, uh, G. Now, I tend in this arrangement not to play that as a harmonic um, because the tonal quality of it as a harmonic sound wonderful, but then the line has to move, and I think the change from the harmonic to the fingered note doesn't sound as good. But the primary difficulty in this passage is that these are basically three chords. <laughs> For the left hand, it's getting your arm in position to play. Crossing over that D string and letting it ring open. And there's a lot of motion in the right arm, if you notice the right arm. It's a particular kind of choreography that 
the right arm has to feel very light and everything come from the shoulder to play that. And then in the left hand, this note moves down to the A. thumb stays put and that's not that much of a big deal. The most difficult motion in the whole piece I think is this motion to the 5-7 chord. And trying to get those notes in tune because of the way that the right arm moves and finding this finding this seventh of that chord it's probably the most difficult note to play in tune. It's a little awkward for the right hand being in this position. Um, so I think the best way to practice this section, first of all, is to alter, uh, sorry, isolate the right hand and get that motion, I would say under your fingers, but maybe better to say under your shoulder, this floating right hand technique. For the left hand, I think it's really all about um, practicing those three chords as chords. I mean, they're arpeggiated chords. And making them sound good as, I guess, a pizzicato triple stop. Not one of these, but the way we're going to be playing it. And then the sus chord. Five seven chord, and the relationship between this leading tone and this seventh. I found to be the most difficult thing in the entire piece, and so of course you know when that happens you spend the most time trying to practice that passage. It's it's almost like a, a sublime joke on us that it, it comes right at the end of the piece um, when it works it sounds wonderful when it doesn't work you know what can you say try try again uh, but anyway to practice this passage turn it into three chords sounds a bit drunken. And then on the very final chord of the piece, Bach wrote it, of course, as a triple stop um, to be played with the bow across the strings. Um, and it really just does not work that way on the double bass. So I've, in this arrangement, I've just broken it up to be a double stop down here, which I actually break. And then moving to the open harmonic G which makes a kind of sense with this arrangement because there have been several other stopping points in the piece at the end of the first section, at the end of the second section, both end on a D harmonic, so it's fitting that the piece should end on a G harmonic. So, uh, yeah, this last section, this last cadence, should probably take as much practice time as, you know, the 10 or 12 measures that came before it or 20 measures that came before it, it is that difficult. But once you find a feeling for those chords, it is possible to make it work. And you get all of this choreography working together and when it works, it's a really, really wonderful thing. I found this challenge uh, of this particular passage to be incredibly illuminating, not only for just playing of Bach you know, on the bass, but also for my jazz playing, for playing double stops, but most importantly for playing legato. So that's the third section of the piece. In conclusion, I hope you've enjoyed this presentation of this arrangement of Bach's Prelude, but more importantly, I hope that through studying this music, you have found something, some technical hurdle that you've been able to overcome, or some approach to playing this music that you can take forward into your own music, be it jazz, bluegrass, Americana, indie, doesn't matter, pizzicato basis, 
have every bit as much right to play this music as anyone, and I hope that uh, anyone watching will continue to explore the cello suites for themselves to make their own arrangements of this music because the overall um, end game of this is for us all to become better bassists and better musicians. So thanks for tuning in and I hope to see you next time.